Thank you for coming to our um, third talk of the CVL Science Luncheon Center. And today I'm very happy to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Jian Liu. Um, he's a new-ish assistant professor at UT Southwestern at the um, Advanced um, Imaging Research Center in the Department of Radiology. Before coming here in 2020, uh, he received his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Minnesota. After that, he did a postdoctoral fellowship at NINDS at NIH, looking at T2 star image, imaging properties. Um, and then now as an assistant professor at UT Southwestern, he's continuing his work on quantitative imaging. And most interestingly to many of us in the audience today, he's working on iron-based tissue properties using high field MRI, which is what he will talk to us about today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Liu. So I will speak without a mask so that you probably you can hear me better. Uh, thank you so much for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me to come here to give the talk. I have known the center for a while uh, as mentioned by our previous director Dr. Dean Sherry and uh, only today I realized we are physically so close. Yeah. So um, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Also thank you uh, uh, Dr. Roderick for the recommendation to the speaker list. So today uh, my topic will be about uh, high resolution MRI and their application in uh, imaging iron uh, at ultra high field. So I think most of you are familiar with MRI. Uh, it has really great uh, soft tissue contrast. This is an advantage especially for the brain because the, the subtle uh, contrast difference really uh, can be uh, very sensitive in MRI imaging and it can be uh, flexible to imaging different uh, aspects of the tissue. So <clears throat> looking at the left figure here, uh, this actually is the, sorry, you see my cursor now, it's the amyloid uh, deposition on the uh, micro vessels. And uh, apparently we using uh, a non-invasive in vivo approach, we are far from getting to this resolution. But on the right, I'm showing you a high resolution MRI. Uh, we got in the, on the 70 MR scanners, you can still pre see a lot of details, although uh, we are far from the left. However, uh, with the development of uh, uh, through a syn synergetic uh, effort, we are uh, hoping to bridging the gap across the scales by better uh, designing the hardware, the software, and uh, imaging acquisition, reconstruction, algorithm, etc. Under the engineering uh, aspect, we, we, we uh, together with uh, novel knowledge about how to interpret the signal we observe uh, related to the fundamental tissue properties. Of course, we, uh, we continue and push for uh, a more powerful uh, computers to uh, analyze a large amount of data and through a multi-model approach, we, uh, that's my vision now, how we can bring, uh, bridge the gap uh, eventually. So uh, in my talk today, I will cover a few things, including a brief background about uh, magnetic susceptibility and their application in MRI. So uh, to uh, go to very high resolution, we, I want to uh, show you that how critical motion and the uh, secondary effects such as the field uh, correction is. And then I will show you an example of applying this technique to detect cortical lesions in multiple sclerosis. In the end, uh, I'm still uh, working on an ongoing project. We are uh, pushing for very high resolution. I have some preliminary data to show and uh, uh, share with you some insights. It's, a, it's not a conclusive uh, study yet, but hopefully uh, we can inspire more discussion, uh, collaboration opportunities. Um, magnetic susceptibility is a, is a property describing how the, the material responds to an external field. So depending on the uh, the status of electron in the uh, molecule. So with a paired, uh, with an unpaired electron, the electron spin will be, uh, the magnetization from those electron spins will, uh, sorry, I don't think you can see my cursor here. Um, the, it, under this situation, it tends to enhance the overall, overall field. Um, meaning uh, if I use a simple analogy, if you uh, treat this 
uh, source of a magnetic susceptibility as a magnetic bar, this bar will be aligned in the same direction as the external field. So the total effect is enhancing the field, and this is called the paramagnetism. On the other hand, for some for other molecules without um, uh, like unpaired electron, the dominant uh, magnetization effect will be determined by the electron orbit, and that tends to reduce the total field, and this is known as a diamagnetism. In the bi biological tissue, uh, we have different source of uh, susceptibility, and uh, uh, their effect can be uh, reflected in the MR signal we acquire. So here I just use a, a simple diagram. Now we have a, now if you imagine this is a, the, 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 the cross section of a vessel, and uh, if it's in the external field B0, it will uh, generate this kind of dipole shaped field distortion in its vicinity. Now we have a voxel located right here. The signal within this voxel will be the sum of the individual, uh, like uh, uh, the, all the signal from these different locations. The, the, the effect is that because of the frequency or the, the field which determine the frequency are so different in the voxel, and the, the sum of them uh, will uh, show a, a signal magnitude decay, which is known as a T2 star magnitude decay. Uh, most cases like exponential curve and the phase uh, of this average signal will uh, ever evolve uh, based on the average frequency within the voxel and the, the time which is also called echo time and uh, T2 star weighted MRI has very high sensitivity to detect this kind of uh, field dis uh, dis distortion or inhomogeneity there are many different uh, sources of uh, susceptibility in biological tissue. So uh, here I just list, list a few. Uh, one, as you know, the deoxygenated hemoglobin and ferritin, they both contain iron and the center of the, the, the large molecule, they are uh, paramagnetic. And the lipid within the bi, uh, bilipid layer of the myelin uh, sheet around the axon, they have a, a diamagnetic properties. So uh, here I'm showing a histology uh, comparison, uh, which is uh, myelin stain and iron stain. We can see a very nice uh, co-localized distribution of the myelin and iron. Uh, th this is because uh, we know, based on our knowledge now, the oligodendrite is the myelinating glia in the brain. They are uh, generating and maintaining the myelin structure. Because of this very large surface to volume ratio of myelin, it requires a lot of energy to, uh, to work. So iron is known as a, a critical metal that is involved in the uh, energy trans, uh, energy generation. Uh, so that's why we uh, in the myelin, when we see high uh, amount of, uh, sorry, see this cursor again. So that's why when we see a uh, high concentration of myelin, we usually see high concentration of iron in the brain tissue. And the interesting because they both have a unique uh, magnetic susceptibility compared to the uh, water, so they uh, contribute uh, to overall enhanced uh, relaxation decay rate, R2 star, which is inverse of T2 star. And uh, this is shown here, uh, uh, which captured by the high resolution MRI. Uh, I, I partially mentioned iron has many different roles uh, in maintaining the uh, normal function of brain tissue, so including uh, energy generation through the mitochondrial respiration, uh, mining synthesis and maintenance. Under uh, certain uh, circumstances, such as uh, like uh, invasion of a uh, external bacteria or virus, iron will be involved in uh, generation of the free radicals uh, to clean uh, the external invaders. And uh, more importantly, the brain has very complicated system we still don't fully understand to regulate the homeostasis of iron. If this process fails, it can cause oxidative stress and cause tissue damage that uh, has been known in uh, many different neurological disorders. So here I just give an example from the Alzheimer's uh, disease. You can see the top is the high resolution T2 star weighted MRI magnitude at the difference uh, from different uh, pa uh, patients with various stage of the disease and compared with uh, a different uh, histology. Uh, if we, if we uh, 
uh, look at the iron stain and compare with that with the T2 star waiting MRI, we can see that as the disease progress more severely, uh, the iron start to accumulate from the uh, at different layers of the cortex. So this, this can be uh, actually captured in the T2 star weighted MRI. And we can also validate this different disease stage by comparing iron versus uh, uh, existing biomarkers such as amyloid and tau. So this suggests potentially we can develop MRI as a uh, non-invasive in vivo tool to uh, track uh, the disease progress. Uh, in the, another um, application that I, I have been involved in the past is multiple sclerosis. So on the left, I'm showing a sub PO lesion, uh, which developed from the under, just right under the PO surface into the cortex. Because of the loss of myelin, the T2 star weighted the magnitude will look brighter compared to the normal looking cortex. And, and uh, uh, this, this feature has been shown to be a very sensitive biomarker for uh, especially using the seven Tesla T2 star weighted MRI compared to other imaging mortality to detect the sub PO lesion. Another case is in the white matter lesion, although we have been um, like a, imaging the white matter lesion has been the, the standard in the clinical practice, but there are still some uh, interesting aspects that we haven't observed before when the uh, signal, when the resolution is not high enough. For example, here, in the uh, face image around the lesion, uh, we can see uh, two, uh, maybe two uh, very interesting uh, features. Within the lesion, there is a, usually there is a way. So that helps to improve the specificity of detecting uh, um, MS lesion compared to other uh, demyelinating disease. The second feature is around the, the lesion, there is a array. This array, uh, this indicates a high, uh, high amount of iron uh, likely associated with the increased level of a macrophage or microglia as a marker of active disease pro process. So uh, people also shown that this, this biomarker is uh, associated with the long-term uh, progress progression and the disability progression of the patient. Um, hopefully I convince you ultra high field MRI is interesting. So uh, at, uh, beyond the clean, standard three Tesla MRI is considered an ultra high field MRI. The sun Tesla was uh, recently approved for uh, by the FDA for uh, clinical applications. With the higher field, we gain in the signal to noise ratio. We also gain in the uh, susceptibility contrast as reflected in the T2 star weighted signal. And both of these can give us uh, the advantage to reduce the voxel size and see better details uh, in the brain. So here I just show an example of the MS lesion at a 1.5 T. You can see it's uh, almost just a white matter lesion. But in, at 70, you can see uh, actually uh, the cortex is also involved. Of course, there are uh, no free lunch. There is a lot of there are lots of challenges to work at a higher field. The first is the cost of uh, in terms of infrastructure, the purchase and maintenance of this kind of super gigantic um, gen a magnet. You can see how large it is compared to this person right here. And we have also have to uh, overcome the limit limitation uh, by the physics laws to deal with the inhomogeneity of the static B0 field and uh, uh, the radio frequency field, also known as the RF field. And there will also increase the safety uh, risk uh, caused by the RF induced tissue heating. And uh, in the end, it's uh, more sensitive to all kinds of uh, artifact sources. In the next uh, few slides, I will just show you one, um, maybe not one, but uh, motion is a significant challenge to go with higher field and higher resolution. As we decrease, decrease the voxel size, um, we, we need to scan longer and even uh, very basic motion such as respiration can tend to cause the movement of the object to be more than voxel size. A secondary effect is the B0 field, the static field which uh, will fluctuate as the uh, subject uh, breathes or move their head. And this effect increases with the field strength. So we have to deal with them. <clears throat> Here I'm showing a measured uh, field change caused by respiration. So each image is one slice at a different uh, uh, location within the, within the brain. 
as you can see, uh, in general, it's quite uniform, and the magnitude increase if we go towards the uh, lower part of the brain. So uh, here I'm showing a, a data set I, I, I recently collected on our 70 at UT Southwest. So this is the two echo images, meaning that we, are, we acquire these two at different time points after the RF excitation. So the you can see in this first image looks pretty uh, pretty nice without apparent artifact. That means uh, the subject was quite still. But in the second image, we already see uh, this uh, bright and darker variant uh, artifact. This is most likely due to the field change uh, across the scan because we always breathe and this uh, respiration induced field effect is uh, going on. So that uh, that effect as the echo time increase becomes more amplified. And if the the brain or the head moves, then it gets more complicated. So uh, in the previous respiration induced the B0 chain I show you, you can see it's mostly very smooth, uh, has a low order complexity. But as we uh, as a, we move, the, it's the, the the field change pattern looks more complicated. That means it's more difficult to uh, to measure it and use it in the correction. There has been different ways to try to address the issue of motion and the B0 correction. So you can either use uh, external device such as optical camera to measure motion or field camera to measure the B0, um, but uh, it's more expensive and they uh, generate burden on the, uh, especially in the clinical setup with limited budget. Um, the second type of approach use uh, so-called uh, um, navigator signal, which is based on the intrinsic MR signal sensitivity to both motion and B0, uh, B0 field. So we can develop, um, use clever uh, design to, uh, to quantify both uh, without using external device. But it always it's not, there's no like a simple answer because in order to have enough information to to have enough information for sufficient accuracy, we, we need always need more measurement or more complicated hardware. So that's generate uh, cost and uh, lower the feasibility on the uh, application. So uh, in my uh, previous work, um, the one question we uh, want to address is for the T2 star weighted MR, which is sensitive to both motion and the field change. Um, how can we have a, a ready to use like plug-in type of a, a MRI technique uh, can be easily uh, used by different centers without much trouble so that uh, and also have good accuracy in terms of the, the temporal resolution to measure the artifact sources such as motion and field change and also have uh, yeah, like good enough accuracy. So we developed this uh, navigator. I won't go into the details, but the basic idea is that we know in the early, uh, during, after the, the excitation, before we acquire the high resolution uh, information data here, we have some time that there is, isn't much T1, a T2 star weighted contrast. So we can use this time to play out some very, really fast acquisition, uh, uh, further accelerated by parallel imaging. So if to see if we are able to have a, uh, a low resolution 3D image, but accurate enough for motion and the field, tra uh, tracking the motion and the field change. And this is uh, just an example showing this navigator, how it looks like after reconstruction. So we use this to measure the motion and the field change. And uh, uh, after we have a good uh, measurement technique, we still need to correct for it. It's not straightforward to uh, correct for the nonlinear B0 changes due to motion, as I have shown you in the previous slide. So we need to, uh, we, we here we develop the in hub. We, we develop our own algorithm to correct for both. I, uh, so uh, I won't spend too much details time on the details here. But uh, in the end, uh, we, we get something that uh, the calculation time increase only proportional to the number of the, the voxels and uh, the number of uh, clustering uh, clusters we we use for this algorithm. So it's uh, pretty uh, practical, and we have achieved like very high resolution and and use existing computer hardware to make this work. That's uh, how I established the work uh, from the 
as you will see in the following slides. And here I want to show you an example. Uh, in this one, the, the reference image was acquired when the person was asked to uh, stay still. Uh, and uh, in the uh, another scan, we asked them to move a few times during the scan. You can see without any correction, the image quality looks uh, very completely, completely gone compared to the reference. With the motion of correction alone, we can see the spatial information is partly uh, recovered, but still there are uh, regions that has um, like dark or bright, ar sorry, artifact. This is due to the field change. So further con con uh, correcting for both, we recover something similar, very similar to the reference. So this was uh, done on the 70 MRI uh, we, we have in, in my previous institute with uh, an in-plane 0.5 millimeter and uh, slide thickness of 1.5. So we move down and uh, we have uh, some uh, radio, uh, neuro radiologists who are very interested to use this technique for their uh, studies. So uh, in, a, in a multiple sclerosis group, um, we, we work together to apply this technique. Multiple sclerosis, uh, a brief background, is a demyelinating disease. We, uh, it's, uh, our, the clinical practice has mostly been looking at uh, regions of demyelination within the within the white matter area. Um, but that's not the full picture. Uh, recent, like with in the last maybe two, one or two decades, with the advancement of in vivo imaging, we find there are um, cort cortical lesions or lesions associated with the cortex are very common uh, in the MS patient. So uh, based on the location, this can be uh, categorized into are several subtypes such as subpill lesion, uh, local cortical lesion at the border between the gray and white matter, or the intracortical lesion. The reason people are interested in the cortical lesion is because uh, preliminary studies show it's more associated with the disability level and uh, it could involve a different uh, pathogenesis mechanism. This is uh, especially the case for subpill lesion because uh, it could develop from uh, the uh, mechanism through the cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, if these are all true, that also means the treatment should be different based on the, the subtype of the, of the patient. So, uh, here I just want to show you a comparison of the like, histology showing this subpill lesion and uh, uh, the MRI images at the 70 and 3D. So, we, we can see if we revisit these pictures, we, we, are, we, are, well, we can always say both has some ability to capture this lesion, but definitely I think 70 has better contrast and the signal to uh, sharpness compared to the, uh, the 3D, 3D images. So in this uh, study, we uh, applied the technique in a cohort of patient that has been uh, routinely scanned uh, in this uh, so-called natural history study. Uh, with the 70 MRI hosted at NIH. Uh, we used a 0.5 isotropic 0.5 millimeter resolution in a T2 star weighted GRE. The data was reconstructed using either the corrected mode or uh, the uncorrected mode. In the corrected mode, we uh, correct for both motion and the field change up to the first order because uh, it's just a little uh, more convenient to do this this way and a nonlinear correction was uh, was not involved in this case, and uh, the it also we performed the uncorrected mode by only correct for the global average B zero change. So uh, at the same time, we also acquired the T one weighted MP two range, also with a very high resolution, but it takes uh, uh, for each data set takes uh, uh, ten minutes and repeated three times. So this shows the uh, the we the our radiologists uh, two 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 radiologists independently reviewed all the images and uh, uh, were blinded to the status of the correction of this data. And they gave a score based on the, the, the artifact level. Uh, the score was from one to four with four as the best. You can see uh, for all the scans, they all received improvement of the image quality. Before correction, only uh, less than 20% of the data was rated as a high quality in the three to four category, and after correction, 
this range increased to almost 95%. So here I'm showing you some examples. Uh, this is a, a scan with very uh, low quality before correction. You can see uh, the artifact level is really, really high. And after correction, it's uh, significantly improved the quality. And this is a room zoomed in region, showing that if we use the uncorrected image to look for cortical lesion, it will be really challenged. And this is another scan when the, uh, where the uncorrected image was re re scored uh, quite nicely with a score of three, and after correction, it's, uh, it was four. So overall, it looks very similar between the two. But if we zoom into the detail, we can see that still along the cortex, this high spatial information was uh, disrupted by uh, even a tiny amount of motion. And uh, uh, so this improved image quality can uh, uh, eventually lead to better visualization of the cortical lesion. So the, here are three examples for each uh, one, with one example in each column. Uh, so we can see like uh, the last, uh, uh, the, the two on the left is showing uh, the cases where the initial uncorrected data image, um, in, in that image, the lesion was not found, and uh, but but were found with the correction. And this was further correct, uh, confirmed by the, uh, the T1 weighted and P2 ridge data. So uh, we see the, the shape, both the shape and the, the uh, extension of the lesion was better defined after the correction. And in the last row, uh, last column is another example of a false positive. So the, this was found, uh, identified as a lesion before correction uh, because of this hypo intensity in this corner, but it was uh, not identified uh, in the you know, corrected data, also confirmed in the T1 weighted image. So uh, in the two categories uh, with initial high quality, only uh, four cases, and the initial low quality in the rest, um, we found that the number of cortical lesions in the low quality was almost doubled, while in the high quality is uh, roughly the same. So this means high, like double the sensitivity to detect the cortical lesion with this uh, correct correction approach. And the, uh, even though we spend a lot of effort trying to increase the field strength and uh, other technical challenges, without addressing this uh, image quality issue, um, it will not give us the expected uh, performance. So uh, to exclude the, um, the possibility that this different uh, a number of lesions, different sensitivity to detect lesions is due to um, the experience of the image readers or their own standard criteria, we also uh, retrospectively reviewed all the lesions that we found. So um, within the 52 lesions that was found only in the corrected data, we find that only 8% can be seen clearly in the uncorrected image. However, in the 14 lesions that was only clearly, uh, were, were only clearly uh, initially identified in the um, uncorrected image, majority of them, 86%, can be seen in the corrected image. So this just to confirm the efficacy of this approach. So that's, uh, that's uh, I wrapped up with that uh, MS application. And uh, for the next, I want to move on, move forward uh, onto uh, some, um, some of my most recent, more recent work. So this idea of non-invasive in vivo histology is not new. Um, with uh, histology with uh, invasive like approach, working on the, the tissue uh, slice, we can, go to really high uh, spatial details such as nanometer, even like mini, uh, micrometer even or even better. But how about using an approach which is non-invasive and in vivo, what can we go? Where can we go? So this is, uh, I, this uh, bring us to this so-called mesoscopic scale in the range of hundreds of uh, micrometers. That's actually what we are achieving now with high resolution MRI. So here, the voxel size uh, here I'm showing is around half a millimeter. And uh, this figure is the cross-section of the cortex. 
as you can see in this uh, either this neural density neuron uh, density stain or this uh, stain that is showing the uh, cytochrome it shows very different structures across the layers of the cortex and our voxel size is low is laid out here it covers a fraction of the cortex that means we could potentially uh, better understand the brain structure and how the brain works we know that uh, within the cortex there are different layers and each layer takes uh, has different role in processing the input and sending out the output so this also means we can also better understand the function of the brain if we have enough high resolution um, so in my lab um, we have pretty good knowledge background about how to understand the susceptibility contrast and work with higher ultra high field uh, we have a good tool to address the issue of uh, motion and field uh, field change and uh, um, hopefully the 70 or high, even higher field can uh, give us enough contrast to noise ratio so that we can do everything with a, within a reasonable amount of scan time and uh, what's our next step we expect with high resolution imaging we can better understand the tissue uh, properties at very high resolution by uh, modeling the signal we acquire uh, related to the more fundamental biophysics parameters and hopefully this outcome can provide people better guidance for uh, optimal method design in specific applications so in this current study uh, we just simply try to push for even higher resolution so what this is what we uh, achieved with 0.3 by 0.3 by 0.4 uh, voxel size uh, at 70 and each scan lasts for 35 minutes so you may laugh this is extremely long but hopefully uh, with this knowledge we can better design uh, our approach in the future and uh, in this study we also quantified the relaxation rate r to star and susceptibility uh, for uh, in as a as a as an outcome of the of the high resolution data so next i'm going to show you some uh, preliminary uh, either images or data that we have acquired so far so um, here is the t2 star weighted magnitude uh, in the focus on the uh, uh, primary visual cortical region and this is the reconstructed susceptibility from the same data and uh, on the right i'm showing uh, the textbook of the myelin i mean showing the like white is myelin and dark is gray matter as you can see uh, within the within v1 primary visual cortex this brighter line is has been known for more than 100 years as the line of generic it's a very significant marker only exists in the primary visual cortex and uh, interestingly we can also see it uh, using the high resolution mri so you can see this dark line dark band in the center of the cortex and from the uh, the susceptibility reconstruction we see you can also see this brighter band uh, meaning that uh, this region is richer in iron compared to others so this is uh, a cross section of the including the frontal region and the uh, basal ganglia you can see uh, so the, the both the frontal cortex basal ganglia and the hippocampus right here has been a target in neurodegenerative disease and uh, we, people uh, usually use the uh, original interest average value for the, for example the susceptibility to correlate that with uh, the either the disease uh, stage or the cognitive performance of the patient so i look at this from yeah, with this high resolution data we can see more like uh, details such as in this frontal region this bright um, susceptibility band is at the uh, border between the gray and white matter so this region is also known as the superficial white matter um, the susceptibility shows uh, a, a better contrast compared to the, the magnitude data and now if we move on to the basal ganglia you can see in the putamen and in the uh, within the internal uh, internal uh, capsule 
we, we not only see the overall dark looking uh, image in the magnitude or bright uh, iron rich kind of appearance in the susceptibility, but we also see in this uh, this bundles of the white matter in both regions in the putamen and the internal capsule. And in the hippocampus, so we are also seeing some details like this. So in the within the mid in the middle section of the hippocampus, oh, sorry. Um, this is the, the the stratum. We can see the stratum is high, also very high in in the in potentially in, in iron because the susceptibility shows a very bright signal. So if we um, take all of this and apply this on the patient, we may we may see that because we, we are interested in iron accumulation in a lot of neurodegenerative disease. So we could better understand the residence of iron within the different compartment rather than the whole uh, like a region average that could give us more accurate, uh, better accuracy and also um, better uh, specificity. So uh, uh, here is showing the results of the uh, layer average R2 star and the susceptibility uh, in the primary visual cortex. It, each, each curve is from a different layer. We segmented the cortex uh, into uh, the superficial layer, the lyomaginary, which is in, in the middle, and the deeper layer. So you can see that, uh, first of all, both R2 star and the susceptibility has unique, uh, very unique value uh, between the layers. And uh, a second thing very interesting is the result also shows a dependency on the orientation of the cortex relative to the B0 field. This is, this is especially the case in the susceptibility. So we are still trying to understand where this source is, uh, where this is from. Apparently, we, we should exclude um, maybe it's due to the reconstruction of the susceptibility, etc. but we have uh, we are, have done some uh, initial work and pretty confident this is not from the this uh, 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 trivial reasons. So we have learned a lot about the, the orientation effect of uh, both the T2 star and the frequency, uh, which is from the phase data and related to the susceptibility. They have orientation effect uh, relative uh, in the white matter. In the white matter, it's a uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's easier, but it's um, maybe more controllable because uh, we can find a region that the axons are mostly aligned uh, with each other. So we can better understand how this uh, orientation effect arises. And this is just showing some previous work uh, to uh, understand the uh, orientation dependent R2 star or the frequency. And I just uh, uh, cover uh, the, the two major uh, reasons. First is the this arises from the anisotropic susceptibility. So the myelin is uh, wrapped around the axon. Within the myelin and the membrane, the lipid molecules are uh, highly ordered uh, relative to the structure of the myelin in general. So uh, this long lipid chain has its own very uh, strong anisotropy of its magnetic properties. And in the in vivo data, only when we uh, correct it for both the isotropic and anisotropic susceptibility, the, 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 the fit between the measured data and the, the uh, biophysics model uh, is uh, improved compared to uh, only considering the isotropic susceptibility. But that's not. Uh, everything. There is also this so-called microstructure effect. So uh, the water molecule essentially is the, our sensor to report the MR signal. Water molecule can uh, uh, resides in different compartments relative to the, uh, the cell. So some can be in the axon, the so-called axonal water. Some can be within the myelin layers and it's more closely, uh, it's closer to the to the lipid and uh, which is the magnetic source and the sum also is in the external uh, extracellular space as the as you can see here as the uh, tissue varies orientation to the B0 field 
the frequency introduced by this structure change uh, very dramatically. And this gives rise to the, um, to the need that we need to model the signal, not just using a simple like a one uh, exponential decay or one linear phase uh, evolution, but use multiple components. So this is comparing the, the model and the, the measured data. You can see that. Uh, so maybe the, the multi expensive decay is, isn't very clear, but this is after fitting the data using multiple exponentials to the magnitude decay, we achieve better uh, fit. And uh, it's more obvious in the, in the frequency or the, 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 the frequency data, which is from the phase. So within, with one single uh, compar compartment, uh, the phase will be a linear relationship with time. So that means the frequency extracted will not be echo time dependent, but what we observe is a highly uh, echo time dependent frequency measurement, and this can only be better uh, explained if we consider this multi uh, microstructure effect. So this is what we have learned from uh, studying the vital matters, and in the cortex it's more uh, complicated. So uh, this is some uh, I really like this, uh, these figures. It compares a uh, two different approach, actually three. Here is the histology. So histology is showing the myelin stain, and uh, this is a, a, a optical measurement of the, the orientation of the axons. So you can see uh, this red indicate the axons are mostly perpendicular uh, or radic radial or perpendicular to the cortical surface, and the green means the axons are um, in parallel to the cortical surface. So these white arrows indicate the band of this. Uh, in the V1, it will be the line of Gennari, uh, also known as the band of a Berliger, and the, the, these arrows indicate this highly myelinated band. But if we look at the um, right uh, close to these arrows, this uh, red color actually start to uh, dec not to, to be not so red. That means there are crossing of fibers. And here is a reconstructed uh, fiber tracking using uh, diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging. We, uh, it's also reproduced uh, a similar uh, pattern of the fiber orientation with, uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of radio fiber uh, fibers, but also lots of parallel fibers. So if we want to understand the, the data we observe, the orientation uh, effect, we need to have uh, developed this kind of model. So uh, that means the parallel fibers uh, indicated by this greenish color tend to uh, generate orientation dependent uh, curve of the susceptibility that is in this shape. And the radio fibers, because of its 90 degree uh, orientation difference, it will have an opposite trend. And what we observe, what I'm pro uh, proposing is the sum of the two. So this is this, this is what we have observed. So we can uh, model or use some additional measurements such as myelin measurement or um, uh, orientation fiber dispersion measurement. We could potentially better understand this observed orientation effect and better understand the, the, the microstructure within the cortex. So, um, so you may ask me what resolution do I need? In, in this original uh, data with 0.3 in plane, we, it took 35 minutes to acquire this data. Do we really need that much? So to answer this, we can simply uh, downsample the data and see what do we lose at different lower resolutions. So at 0.5 isotropic millimeter, we still get a lot of details in terms of this intracortical structures. Um, but if we go to a 0.8 isotropic, we already uh, are not able to uh, see these intracortical structures. Um, to explain this is very simple because we know this line in physiology is only 0.3 millimeter thick. But how about the the R2 star and the uh, uh, susceptibility that we measured across the cortex. So uh, here I'm showing like at the different resolutions, what are the, the value, the layer specific 
value at the, the different court, uh, layers, you can see that for the uh, both R2 star and the susceptibility, we are not able to differentiate uh, the different layers at a lower resolution, uh, starting from 0.8 or here I'm also showing one millimeter. But another uh, also very important aspect is that in every layer, when we uh, decrease the resolution, the susceptibility becomes more negative. That means even though we know in histology iron accumulate in the in cortex, we may lose the sensitivity to detect iron if we do not have enough uh, resolution because the cortex, the, the white matter, uh, right, like the 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 white matter can dilute the signal we measure and drag the whole susceptibility to the more negative range. So in summary, uh, I have shown a high field MRI um, uh, strength really facilitated the high resolution imaging uh, in the uh, magnetic properties of tissue. And uh, the way the approach I, we have been working on is the T2 star weighted MRI. It's a similar type of acquisition for different uh, um, techniques. There have been a lot of names such as susceptibility weighted MRI, quantitative susceptibility uh, mapping. They all fall into this umbrella. And uh, hopefully I, I convince you that the microscopic MRI is feasible um, uh, in the recent advancement, uh, recent uh, technical uh, advancements, and we can use it for intracortical uh, structural imaging. And uh, for me, I'm really excited to obtain this additional uh, spatial dimension to look. Uh, hopefully we can apply these techniques in uh, clinical applications and the basic science to better understand uh, how the intracortical structures and uh, I have shown that motion and the B0 correction is critical uh, as uh, like it's one of the bottleneck we need to uh, address. I want to thank uh, uh, collaborators and uh, my previous mentors uh, for uh, getting involved in this work. Uh, so for the, uh, the the Jeff Down and the Peter Van Helderen are an MR physicist in my previous lab. Jeff was my advisor and we work on this project together. And Danny Reich uh, helped us to, uh, he's uh, the clinical collaborator. Uh, we, we work on this uh, MS project. And uh, uh, the, the, the high resolution QSM uh, reconstruction was helped uh, tremendously by Dr. Xu Li and uh, Peter Van Zell from Johns Hopkins. Also, uh, I'm very happy to be here to show my uh, recent work and thank you for your invitation. Thank you for attending. Hopefully, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. So cool. These things in the world, I like more than looking at MRI images for an hour. So <laughs> thank you for that. Thanks. Um, it 100% makes sense that you have to start this type of research looking where there are like bands of eyeliner or you know straight up straight eyeliner or whatever. So it's um, it's not just your bearing. Yeah. How, how easily or how quickly do you think you'll be able to apply that kind of around the whole cortex when you don't have the signal to kind of help you out? Like, do you think that signal is kind of there mm. now to look at like yeah, three yeah. of the six layers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, there are many like things I'm thinking related to this. So first of all, so you can see uh, the, the data I show you is uh, like a 3D volume imaging. The SNR definitely gets lower near the center of the brain, but in the cortex around the brain still has similar amount of SNR in the frontal or, or back. And uh, uh, so I only, in this 0.3 millimeter resolution, it took 35 minutes, but I think uh, we don't really need that high resolution. I've shown like half a millimeter still good. That can reduce the scan time and also provides better coverage of the whole brain instead of just uh, uh, like uh, maybe 30 millimeter or 40 millimeter volume. That's what this high resolution data was. But I hope to get whole brain and uh, uh, with uh, like a 10 to 15 minute scan with enough SNR. So that's that's very feasible. Yeah. 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 Don't be scared by this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, this is so cool. 
Mm. Sure, yeah. Um, is, it, is it applicable to like functional scanning? Um, yeah, definitely. I, do you want me to go? It's easier to, to explain. Oops. Anyway, so uh, this navigator was acquired right after the axle power excitation. Takes about five milli, millisecond, and uh, for the rest, for like T2 star weighted, we typically have a TR of uh, maybe 50 millisecond, that's uh, or 30, 40 millisecond. So this five millisecond isn't significant relative to the whole acquisition window. And uh, but with five millisecond, it's not enough to have a 3D uh, image. So we are, uh, it's basically like a segmented image. So we, we, we go, we typically, in our current implementation, it takes about uh, six TRs to assemble uh, one navigator at uh, maybe like uh, between four and six, uh, with four to six uh, millimeter resolution. So that uh, one volume of this navigator is about, uh, is less than 0.5 second. So that still have a very good temporal resolution. And uh, to answer your question, for either structure or uh, or functional, because they all use um, like GRE acquisition, right? So that doesn't change that. But uh, for uh, so it works for either this T two star weighted or or like an EPI type of GRE for fMRI. And uh, some drawbacks. So in this study, I we acquire this navigator early because we don't want to interrupt with a T2 star weighted image. But what we see is that we lose in SNR, because we lose this early period. And I cannot do like a, like a multi uh, exponential fitting because the fast decaying component is already gone by the time I acquire the high resolution data. So that's something I, in the future, I want to move this navigator towards the end. So maybe the thir first 30 milliseconds, we acquire this high resolution data have enough SNR and uh, CNR. In the end, we acquire navigator. We can use all kinds of acceleration, like parallel imaging or some fancy reconstruction to make it accurate and also fast. So the correct is within volume within volume, not cross volume. So the idea is to correct the motion that is occurring during the acquisition of a specific Volume. Yeah, for this structural imaging it takes 10 minutes or longer. So there is can be a lot of motion during that period. For functional MRI, usually TRI is three or four seconds. Probably we don't need this type of stuff, but we can use some other tricks to, to reduce the intro, uh, intro volume or intro scan, uh, intro scan uh, motion. Um, you could do also do a function MRI in a different way, right? So you can push for very high resolution, but um, for her, like every TR you acquire same same case space that doesn't give you image, but you can repeat. Let's say we acquire a hundred TR with the same case space, and for the next hundred we shift the case space. Then with this navigator we can figure out like when. At what, what after the stimulation at this time point, we can assemble all the data, get one image, essentially like averaging, and it give us high resolution, a high SNR. So how would that get around spin history? Uh, spin history event is better, it can be partially reduced by using volume excitation. In the edge, we still have it, but in the center, I hope we are fine. Yeah, it's not completely gone, but that can help. Okay. Spin history is worse with the 2D acquisition, slice by slice. Yeah. Maybe, um, so in that development, I think it's and we've questions about that one, we've been thinking about future clinical applications. How far have you gotten in your work in terms of quantifying this in a reliable, reasonable way across the groups? Uh, is it at the level of looking at patient groups or not, and qualitative kind of assessment, or you could talk about that a little bit? Yeah, 
So the, the result uh, I showed you in the last uh, few slides are from uh, 11 uh, subjects. The, the, the data I show is uh, the group average. Uh, you can see that uh, because of this high resolution, the, the, SN, the SNR is will, the, the higher amount of noise will uh, make the R2 star have, so R2 star let's say is 30 to 40 per second in the cortex. What our uncertainty from noise is 10, is in range of 10. By average, we can reduce that, but the motion and field correction will improve it from like, let's say 20 to 10 or 20 to, to 14. Basically, reducing this uncertainty due to other sources, but the thermal noise, we really can't uh, eliminate that. So, uh, it's, what I want to say is still quite reproducible. We have 11 subjects. If you look at the, the bar along the, the curve, it's pretty tight. So, uh, definitely for single walks, it will be challenged, but we can develop some type of a maybe layer average approach, automatic layer segmentation into the region of interest. We can get pretty good uh, uh, reliability. I haven't uh, uh, tried any of this on patient yet. Mm -hmm. That hopefully that's the next step. Yeah. Uh, in the like uh, in the last yeah. project. Uh, mostly the the yeah the subject we scan mostly are between the twenty or forty year, year old range. Yeah. And those those data were from the Western. No, no, not not yet. So actually, my second question was, um, how much have you gotten to, to try that out and apply your methods there, and how is that is that working for these kinds of things? Yeah, it's uh, it's mostly the time. I I, I like I my available time. It's uh, yeah. I spend uh, maybe a few weeks looking to the sequence programming, try to figure out the Philips language versus Siemens language. So it's, it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> takes time. But I do have a collaborator from Hopkins. They are also interested because we work together on this paper and they feel, oh, we should do this. We have been doing QSM for 10 years, but we always stop at one millimeter. We should get this down. They have postdocs. They, they are helping me now to work on this. Oh, so there is also a Denmark group. They develop different uh, motion correction. We get the, the patch from them. So we recently just tested, tested it on the 70. Once you have this kind of worked out, how affordable do you think it might be with 3T? Um, that's a really good question. So recently I uh, acquired a lot of data on the 3T, like with 0.5 mm resolution, uh, looking at the different contrasts, but I feel it's quite noisy. It's like the 70, you can reduce the scan time by half. That's a lot. Two is maybe it's not a big number, but that's definitely very helpful for the for our study to run. And uh, with 3T, I feel if we can, I can scan the people for two hours, I can get something similar to this. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. More average always helps, but not yeah. not, not very practical. Yeah. Okay. And this, this work I haven't seen, have you been focused exclusively on, I understand why you're focused on cortical mm -hmm. given, but have you done any sub Yeah, so this hypo I, okay. I have seen like uh, this susceptibility in the stratum is so so high compared to the rest. So if we can just uh, segment the hippocampus more carefully and look at this susceptibility differently, that may be better in terms of sensitivity. Looking forward to work with yeah, yeah. you guys on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.